I am having some connectivity issues and I had to restart both my tablet and PC. If you can give me a moment, I just need to see if I can get the uh, syncing to work. So hopefully the tablet sync works and I can cast my tablet, otherwise I'm dead in the water this morning. For the time being, if you can uh, you know, if you get some feedback from you in terms of the touch session yesterday, uh, please send that to me on Slack. I would very much... Right, so tablet synced. Um, I would very much like to get your feedback on that. I have uh, not yet gone through all the groups, discussion, uh, discussions, and we'll do so in time so that I can get a better idea of, of what you are, what, what you dealt with, and um, you know if there were any issues related to that. Okay, so today we'll. Uh, handle some a uh, bit of an overview on uh, feedback and feed forward control. I do understand that I did throw you in the deep end yesterday. Um, that is intentional. The idea was to get you, well, give you a bit of a fright so that you understand that this would not be a Mickey Mouse module. It's not the most difficult one in the world, but um, it's not going to be the most easiest. And from time to time, I am going to expect you to know or at least attempt to figure out some problems that is not related to something that you've dealt with ever before. Um, just referring to one of the TUT questions, I mean, uh, who knows how a microwave work? Um, if you don't know how that works, it, uh, it makes it very difficult to solve that problem. Uh, and I will not test you on something like that, but uh, knowing, you know, at least having a general concept of understanding how physical equipment work and so forth will uh, get you to the point that you can figure out what's going on in a specific problem that is not necessarily related to something like flow or temperature, or let's say just a flow system like a pipeline or a tank, uh, something that you might be a little more used to. In any event, let's start the session with our ever-present blending system. So to, for now, I'm just going to give you an indication of what feedback control and feedforward control is. You do not need uh, to know this yet. This is for CPB purposes. So this module is not control. This module is the dynamics of the system. But for you to understand where we are and where we are going, I would very much like you to understand a little bit about something like feedback control and feed forward control, so that you can keep that in the back of your head and understand and know where, you know, how everything eventually will fit together. It's very difficult to stay focused and, uh, you know, uh, be motivated if you have absolutely no idea why we are do some, doing something. Right, so for the easy one, feedback control. So <clears throat> what that essentially means is there's some element of feedback, obviously. Um, so if you did go through chapter one, you'll see there's a control law, the law definition. 
and that control law defi definition for this specific system refers to something like our um, a change in our uh, or the, the manipulation of our uh, one of our inlet streams will be caused by some feedback from something that happened already so something like uh, feedback from the output let's say okay so we aren't going to discuss that in a great length of detail today i just want to indicate how we go about doing that and let's say in this system there are two things. Uh, obviously, we have our inputs. Otherwise, this is going to get a little more difficult than it should. But so, basic blending system we have a stream containing component X uh, at a fraction of X1, flow rate W1, and another stream containing component X at the fraction of X2, and the flow rate of W2, mass flow rate in this instance. And the outlet is obviously some concentration X uh, and a flow rate W. Both of these are obviously functions of time and they vary. There are a number of things that we uh, most definitely need to control in this system. And um, for now, let's just say we want to control the level in the tank, obviously. We don't want it to run empty or overflow, so we have some form of a level transmitter. And that level transmitter, the purpose of that is to indicate how full our tank is. In order to control that level for this system, very easy to do so, we have some device which we call a controller. And that controller does some mathematical calculations. So it's an electronic device, uh, not always necessarily an electronic device, but most, most often you will find these to be uh, electronic devices and in order to ensure uh, we maintain that level at a specific point regardless of what w1 or w2 is uh, the easiest way is to get some feedback action and manipulate let's say our outlet stream that way if w1 or w2 increases our outlet stream w uh, can increase as well and we maintain that level at a specific set point. Now, this is a feedback controller. Uh, the reason for that is after the level change, we notice it through our sensor LT. So, if we, I know my group uh, had some qu uh, queries regarding what actual sensors and actuators and those sort of things are. Um, now, that sensor is something. Oh, let me do a little bit of a show and tell quickly. Just give me a second. So if is my video center screen for you at the moment or not really? In any event, so what I have in front of me is a, a flow meter. So this is typically an industrial type flow meter. <clears throat> this one has got a half, a one inch uh, bore, which means it's a one inch pipe size uh, fitting. It's a flanged connection, so it connects inside your pipeline. Flow goes through the sensor. Uh, it measures it. Uh, this one is a vortex shedding, it seems like. Um, vortex shedding flow meter and this device here is obviously connected to uh, some power supply and it sends out a signal um, to our control system that signal is in this case a 4 to 20 milliamp signal so it's a current that it varies as the flow rate vary within the range so the sensor doesn't seem to have a flow rate range indicated on it. It's probably in the model number or something like that, regardless. It's got some flow range, so it's, let's say between zero liters per minute to a thousand liters a minute or something like that. So a four milliamp signal will refer to a zero liters per minute flow rate. 
and uh, 1,000 liters per minute will refer to a 20 milliamp signal. So that is the signal that we are typically talking about when we um, when you're talking about a, a transmitter or a controller sending a signal. Now this is a controller. So it's a little electronic device. You should be able to see there are some buttons and two displays. One display is denoted PV, process value, and the other one is denoted SV, which is the set point value. This is a furnace controller. Uh, so this one is specifically for temperature. It has an input of a thermocouple or yeah, thermocouple for this one specifically. So it can measure the temperature from our sensor, the thermocouple, which should you have not have seen one of these ever in your life, it's just a little thin, well, in this case a thin wire, you get them in different uh, diameters and so forth. Got some lead wire, terminates with some exposed wires, those wires connect to specific points on the controller, let's say, and it measures the temperature at the tip of the thermocouple. We'll get into instrumentations, instrumentation in CPB. Um, this is one of the fields that I really enjoy and quite good at, so our measurement is actually right at that tip, and the operation of this it's very simple. It's basically just two wires connected. When you two have two dissimilar metals connected, it generates a potential difference. And that potential difference is, in a specific region, relatively linear uh, related to the temperature. So that sensor connects here. This device then gets input from the user via the buttons. So you set the temp uh, set point, let's say, at 200 degrees C. When the measurement is below 200 degrees C, the output of this device from our controller uh, switches on. Let this, yeah, this is purely a relay one, so it's an on-off controller. Uh, when the temperature is low, it switches it on. When the temperature is high, it switches the element off. Um, so you do get these in feedback versions, so it can have an output of 4 to 20 milliamps or a solid-state relay, which is a uh, kind of a analog uh, output in quote unquote um, but in any event uh, that is so just a electronic device that serves as your controller my laptop can serve as a controller my brain serves as a controller continuously uh, let's say continually doesn't always function properly uh, your cell phone can serve as a controller in some sort of way uh, let's say we all know that our cell phones, uh, if you enable that feature, if you walk into the sunlight, it detects more intense light. Uh, that sensor obviously gives feedback to the system. The system notices, okay, I'm in a more intense light, I can reduce the uh, output to the screen. So you can uh, reduce the contrast or something like that. And it enables it by some form of feedback control system. Right, and then lastly, uh, the thing that we referred to was the actuators. Yeah, I have a half inch control valve. So this is an analog control valve. Um, the valve portion, if we ne neglect the top part and only refer to this bottom part, it does resemble, have some resemblance to the normal, let's say garden tap or something that you see every day. Um, Probably this, well, not necessarily what's going on in the bit, uh, inside, but that doesn't matter to you at this point in time. Um, but in any event, um, this one doesn't have that feature. I'm not going to show you that one is way too heavy. Uh, but in any case, we have some mechanism that changes the electronic signal from our controller that this oak sends out um, to a pneumatic signal. The air pressure on this industry standards 3 to 15 psi uh, and as the air pressure in, uh, increase let's say the valve stem pushes down via a di diaphragm which is this little black strip right here and it closes the valve if the air pressure is reduced a spring returns the diaphragm and moves to the value where it equilibrates with that air pressure inside the diaphragm body 
Right, so that's just a little bit of information on the instrumentation part. Not really required for this module, but understanding it or having some idea of what it is uh, assists you a little bit with how these things actually operate. So I think you've seen enough of my face. Let's go back to the screen. I'll get to all the questions in a little while. Um, just waiting for your screen to update. Right. So we mentioned sensor. And uh, further on in this module, as well as CPB, um, I will not often refer to sensors necessarily. We will talk about measuring elements or um, measurement. So when we talk about a measurement or a measuring element, the measurement is obviously the thing that the measuring element does, but kind of use the word, the, the words for the same purpose. It is basically the thing that detects that change whether it be temperature, level, flow, pressure, uh, concentration or composition, and a, a number of other things that we can that we can detect. Um, but in any case, that refers to our sensor here. Then the controller is obviously some form of a device that com can compare the input value of a set point to our measuring input value and say, okay, well, it's below or above. And depending on the settings that you uh, implement on that controller, it will take some form of a control action. So in the event of a fridge or a freezer, typically uh, your ambient conditions is at a higher temperature, so your control action is inverse. It's, it's in the other way around. Um, so we refer to reverse acting or direct acting. Um, you don't need to worry about that just now, but uh, in the event of a the heating system, obviously, the output must go on if the temperature is below. In a cooling system, the output obviously goes off when the temperature is below the set point. Uh, so be careful about the, uh, words like positive and negative action and things like that. Just uh, kind of puzzle it out for yourself whether you, know, you need on action or off action for a specific uh, scenario based on how that scenario functions. You know, whether you need to input energy or remove energy or something like that. So that's what the, the controller does. <clears throat> These sort of things actually, um, just referring back to yesterday's touch, so we, uh, a lot of those touch questions refer to a thermostat and controller. What that uh, usually is in, in the olden days as well as in um, your domestic hot water system, so your geyser. The thermostat in that has got some bimetal sensor. A bimetal sensor is two uh, metal strips either attached to one another on a flat plate or a coiled version. Um, what the bimetal does, they both heat up, but they have different uh, density ratio uh, relationships with temperature. So as the one metal heats up, uh, same temperature obviously, they, uh, the one expands more than the other and that coil or flat strip uh, deviates from being flat or deviates from the, the kind of coil it is in. So it will either expand a bit more, increase its circumference or decrease its circumference depending on the temperature. Uh, and when it does that, it engages or disengages a contact with the electrical connection so it serves as a switch to enable or disable uh, that electrical contact now in terms of the thermostat where that serves as a controller as well uh, it's got some form of a little knob or dial um, and that kind of just tensions that coil um, a bit more but less uh, to, to determine uh, the possible temperature that it can uh, make a contact or disengage that contact. It's obviously not 100% perfect because it's got a bit of a range. So it will disengage only at, let's say, 45 degrees if the set point is 50, and it will in, uh, engage when, at the temperature of 45 and disengage, let's say, at a temperature of 55, depending on the quality of materials used and the accuracy of that instrument. So you do get them in mechanical or physical type of uh, control 
items, but that is not necessarily used on very complex processing plants that we are dealing with uh, in, in most instances. But that in any case is the controller. So it's got some form of an input in terms of a set point, and it's got some form of an input in terms of a measurement, it compares the two and takes action upon that uh, comparison. The action it takes is eventually to instruct or to uh, actuate some form of an actuator and that form of an actuator is either control valve, a switch for electricity, so being your geezer it will switch on the electricity when the hot water is not hot enough, um, switch on a compressor if you require uh, cooling in an air conditioning system or a fridge freezer. Right. So hopefully you have a better idea of sensors, controllers, and actuators. Um, as I mentioned, it's not 100% required for this module, but at least you hopefully have some better idea now. I'm going quickly going to just check some of the uh, questions or comments. Alex will probably answer yours later on. I'm going to get to FFC now. Yes, most definitely practical. Temperature control of the engine is most definitely some form of feedback control. Correct. Jessica, the actuator is the thing that uh, manipulates the manipulated variable. So. Um, the sensor, controller, and actuator is not independent or, or decoupled from what we call the manipulated variable, controlled variable, and um, disturbance variable. So in, in this case, our sensor refers to our controlled variable because we want to control this level. So we measure the controlled variable, and that is the key thing of the feedback controller. You measure the controlled variable and only when that control variable deviates from what you want it to be, it is then a feedback control. It, it, the feedback controller takes action. So that's where the feedback part comes from. Um, when we look at the block diagram for that, uh, it looks like this. So we have our uh, so it's our level set point that goes into our comparator. I'm doing this in transfer function uh, symbol, so you will get used to this later on. Our valve. So this is where the feedback part comes in. We measure our output, which is our level. That goes through the measuring element, the sensor, and that sensor provides a signal in form of a milliamp signal to our comparator. This, you, there, there should be another block here, but don't worry about that just now. This, we obviously input as some meter value, let's say, so we want it at two meters. It converts it to a milliamp signal based on the characteristics of our sensor. Compares these two, let's say we are at steady state, so we get a 8 milliamp signal from that one, 8 milliamp signal from this one. We have our error, which is currently equal to zero. That is zero, uh, because that is zero, that takes no effect, no effect here, and nothing happens. The moment our set point deviates, or oh, not our set point, our uh, still at milli 8 milliamp. Now we have a 10 milliamp. It says, okay, the error is currently at uh, 2. So it needs to take the appropriate action, either opening or closing the valve to ensure that that uh, error is mitigated. And that is feedback control. Now I'm just going to remove this quickly, not everything. Let's disengage the loop. So there's currently no feedback, but we have our disturbance coming in. which is from our disturbance variable. Our disturbance variable, we hopefully noticed that 
that cannot be measured. So in this case, let's say uh, it can be measured. Uh, it cannot be manipulated. So let's say in our system, this comes from an upstream process. So X1, W1, we cannot um, manipulate. So that we are going to assume is our primary disturbance variable. We cannot manipulate that one, but we can measure it. We can measure, let's say, the flow of that line or the composition, perhaps. And if we can measure that, we can implement uh, what we call feed forward control. Uh, that is our uh, disturbance measurement. It goes to our feed forward controller. And that is added to this error signal. So what that does, this item, the G process, the, the transfer function governing our process, that's the one that contains all the dynamics and, um, well, not necessarily all of the dynamics, some of the other components might have dynamics, um, but it contains the dynamics of the process and this transfer function is the one that contains the dynamics of the effect of the disturbance variable how that relates to our process output, our, our L value eventually. And those two components usually contain some form of dead time. We'll get to dead time uh, later on, but dead time is something that you only see the effect uh, a little bit later on in the process. So it doesn't happen instantaneous. Um, as you all know, nothing happens instantaneous. Uh, in life, it's, it's impossible uh, because there needs to, you know, that's that slow anticipation basically of, of something if let's say you you bump your little your little toe on an edge of a cabinet or something like that the moment you see it's like ah i know what's coming but the pain is not yet there in its full effect and then only after half a second or so you start and get that thumping pain in your little toe um, and that gradually increases up to a point where it's at its steady state value so nothing in life really happens instantaneous. Um, there's also always some form of delay and then a bit of a, a ramp up to that. <clears throat> in any event, so the speed forward control system, we measure that change. If there's any change in that value there, um, our measurement just corrects it or changes the physical value so that the, the change in a flow or something like that to a electronic signal. This GFF. This is based on our model that we develop of our system. So when we develop a mathematical model or empirical model from, from our uh, process data or from first principles, we use that model um, to simulate both GP and GD, the transfer functions covering, covering those effects, but also in our controller uh, for feed forward control. And it's used quite extensively, so it, it's not a fictitious thing or you know ideal scenario. Uh, the controller we, we designed for our ideal scenario because you'll only next year, but you'll see that there are physically unrealizable systems where you kind of predict then, which you can't do because we can't predict the future. We must always um, at least you know just delay it a bit or something like that so that it's not trying to foresee into the future. Um, in any event, so, so the models that we are developing in CPN uh, will eventually determine how we can calculate these things on the screen. And if we do it inaccurately, then our entire basis of how we develop our controllers is incorrect. And that obviously is a massive problem. We want as accurate as possible models within reason so that we have uh, good quality robust uh, and well-performing controllers in controlling our system. So on uh, the microwave one from yesterday, if you were wondering, a microwave does not measure anything. So they, uh, it's difficult, well, it's incorrect to say that. There are fancy microwaves nowadays with electronic, electrical heating elements in them, so the grill function and things like that that will measure temperature 
but the actual magnetron part which provides the microwave energy uh, there's no measurement that takes a measurement of the temperature inside that chamber which is essentially um, very delayed in any case because that temperature will only change if water evaporates out of whatever you are heating up. Uh, the air doesn't absorb microwave energy, it's only water. So the wavelength of microwave energy uh, impinges on water particles, that water particles absorbs that energy and that heat is then uh, transferred throughout the uh, body of food or whatever you have in the microwave. Don't ever test that with metals, it's not going to work and you're going to screw something up. Um, but in any case, so, so the microwave does not measure anything, there's no form of feedback, so a microwave doesn't employ feedback control for the enabling of a magnetron. Uh, yes, Tartu. Tati, you can uh, enable your microphone if you want to speak up. If you can't want to enable your microphone, just type a uh, message in chat. I'll get to those just now again. I do realize that I lost track of what I'm supposed to be doing today but in any case okay no problem um, Alexis temperature control is still using a thermostat the thermostat operation requires a measurement and then change based on that measurement So depending on what temperature control Alex is referring to, any if it's uh, your climate control inside that, um, yeah, that one is different. Uh, but there's also any in, in a vehicle if the fan for the radiator is uh, electronically driven and not belt driven, then it switches on and off. It's not always on. That valve could most probably be Jordan. Right, now uh, back to the discussion we're supposed to be having. In any event, we have our level control here, so that makes it a little bit easier to understand that portion, hopefully. Uh, I am most definitely not going to get everything everything from 2.2 but we'll catch up at a later stage so don't worry about that um, in our system we obviously so, so the important part from yesterday was to identify or at least understand what manipulated controlled and uh, disturbance variables are I will still provide some form of a handout or a session or a recording or something on, on yesterday's stuff just to explain some of those concepts a little bit more in detail <coughs> Uh, it's not going to happen today, but um, I do believe that some of you, um, you know, you're almost there, but not 100%, and I want to fortify that understanding a little bit. In any event, so um, in our blending system, we obviously want to control, so so for, for our system to be uh, running smoothly, we typically want those two values to be constant. So we, we design for a specific flow rate, WT, and we design for a specific composition. Uh, the reason why we want to design for those, because flow rate is important, because if we have a processing plant, we want to be able to ensure our market is always supplied with the right amount of stuff. So we need to ensure that our throughput is, is correct. We don't want to oversupply, because then we obviously reduce the price of the uh, stuff if there's an abundance of something then the price drops and you don't want to withhold too much because otherwise your uh, buyers will eventually say you can't supply me with enough uh, material I'm going to purchase from someone else so the the throughput of a plant is always a very important factor and then obviously composition or quality of a product so if it's let's say we're producing ethanol 
Uh, in terms of beer or something like that, we want that ethanol to be on 5%. The label says so, and it needs to be there. So we need to ensure that that uh, alcohol content is, is correct there. Um, it's not going to be any, any, any longer, otherwise I'm going to want to have one. So we've specified those two, let's say, as our controlled variables. And then we have our four input variables, which are these. So we, and I'm going to touch on 2.2 now in a little bit. So we know that W is affected by W1 and W2. And we all hopefully have, you know, this light that has gone on um, because we know that there's something like a mass balance. If we have steady state, then W equals W1 plus W2. Now, this is the last thing that we are really working with in dynamics because we don't uh, anticipate steady state necessarily for dynamics. We know that w, uh, D, W over DT. So the rate of change of, ah, of, oh, no, that's not right. Sorry, man. Um, DB rho, the rate of change of the volume inside this system. I think accumulation is obviously equal to that. And that is equal to what comes in minus what goes out. And these are all now functions of time. We're not setting any of them as fixed. The important part is obviously uh, when we handle these equations, we know that uh, there are some um, algebraic equations that govern our system. So we can get to the easiest to handle variable, which is let's say H, the height of the tank. We don't want to always work in volume because that does get a little bit tricky because you have uh, varying factors. And in some instances, when it's really complex, you can't assume that rho is constant, then uh, this obviously is not perfectly correct. But we are going to make the assumption in this case. So eventually, this boils down to the HDT. So there we have conservation of mass for our at least this control system here. But uh, that is also required for the other one. Let's say we want to control the composition. The composition is dependent on both the accumulation of material here, as well as the composition of these inputs. So we want to do a component balance. And our component balance uh, then looks something like that. So we have dv rho and then x uh, assuming constantly stirred tank reactor or tank, so uh, assuming that the entire tank is at the same concentration, and that is obviously equal to the fractions or the amount of that compound com uh, component coming in in our two streams. And what is going out? So there we have another uh, equation that governs our um, composition. But the important part in this one now is realizing that H, in this case, if we do not specify some form of a perfect control around or steady state around the W streams, um, then we have the scenario where you have hopefully constant rho and area, but you have H and X. And this is where nonlinear stuff comes uh, comes into play. We we know that uh, we have two variables, let's say x1 and w1, both might vary, and we have some form of a nonlinear system because this multiplication uh, obviously is nonlinear. Everyone following. Good. I see we've 
got about eight minutes left. I do want to handle uh, one more thing. Um, so we're going to leave these equations at this point just now because we are going to handle linearization in the third study theme and we'll get to more of these sort of things uh, later on uh, this week and next week when we handle 2.4 and uh, 2.5 from chapter 2. But at least now you have a half and half an idea of how we go about developing these models. You know, we've, we've been speaking about models and uh, it's always nice to have an idea of where they come from. And they come from our fundamentals. So we're only going to consider the fundamentals for now. At the later stage, we'll look into empirical models. So the stuff that I really wanted to get to today, but uh, that doesn't matter. Our schedule is like putty. We can uh, alter that as we please to some extent. Table 2.1 in the textbook is extremely important to, um, you obviously don't memorize it or anything. I will never ask you to memorize something. Well, not never. Some of it you'll need to memorize, but in any case, uh, table 2.1 is really important for a number of reasons because this kind of dictates on how we go about uh, defining the, what's the word that I would be looking for? The approach that we take in developing our model. If we, we first need to really understand what we want to do with that model. So what's the purpose of that model? And that is where point one comes in. So we, we must, must, must know what the purpose, the reason for that model is. Because if you don't know the reason you're do, doing something, you can very easily over uh, complicate or oversimplify that. Um, and then that model or system is redundant because it doesn't serve the f purpose. It's not fit for purpose and it can't do what it should do. Or if it's over complicated, it can do what it should do, but with excessive amount of work um, a, in developing the model, and B, in uh, troubleshooting afterwards, ensuring that the all the nitty-gritty values that, you know, from the redundant um, equations and so forth that you had is correct so that it's not too finicky. Uh, hopefully, you've seen in some of the mathematic courses, um, differential equations, your starting value, so your uh, initial value, if you make it two, you get one answer. If you make it three, then you suddenly take 30 minutes to get a solution because your uh, solving system runs to a you know way out uh, NAND value and then starts going down again or something like that. So they are very dependent on your starting points. And if your model uh, complexity is way too complex or the model is way too complex, um, then it the the it, it's re it gets really finicky to solve that system. Um, and for that reason, it is so damn important to understand what the objectives of that model is and what the reason is you do that. And that's why you first need to kind of just know, you know, what do I want to do in this system? What is the thing that I want to control? My control objective. And I, I believe some of the TAs uh, posted the question yesterday in that uh, one question where driving a car safely. So safely in that sentence, it's not really used in the question itself, but um, safely within, that's your control objective. So you want to do it safely. Uh, driving a car, the first objective is not to get from A to B, but doing it safely. In any case, that's uh, off the topic. Um, so point one is hopefully covered. Uh, going on to point two draw a schematic diagram of the system. I am going to bombard you with questions that you don't get a drawing for that system. And it is so, so important for you to be able to conceptualize a worded problem into a drawing to understand, as well as the other way around, receiving a drawing and understanding what is going on on that drawing. Um, it's important to do for, from both sides. You need to be able to do, provide the drawing and you need to be able to interpret a drawing or schematic of a system. This is something that you're not going to necessarily re learn this semester, but uh, between this semester, next uh, semester in CPB, as, uh, and then eventually in CPJ in your design project, 
these sort of things become really important and uh, you'll hone those skills then. Um, right, so list all the assumptions involved in developing the model. Uh, try to be parsimonious. So parsimonious being unwilling to do more work. So you want to, to be an engineer, you want to be lazy. And you want to be right spot on with how much should go into it and um, you know ensuring that the exact amount goes goes into that model so it's uh, basically referring boiling out to the model complexity and the assumptions are really important so <clears throat> if we consider a uh, this is probably where i'm going to end today but if we consider a jacketed vessel so this is a closed vessel only the sides are covered by the jacket and that jacket has got steam going through to heat it up and some fluid passes through so it's some form of a heat exchanger uh, this we maintain at 150 let's say and the steam comes in saturated at 10 bar or something like that so it is quite um, relatively high temperature losses to in the to the environment is that a disturbance variable is that a disturbance variable that is relevant to our model that we want to develop for this post some answers in chat please who agrees with marinique So some agree, some don't agree. The question here is, well, what drives that? Uh, what drives the correct answer is also we we need to have some form of an idea of what that size is before you can make the assumption of yes, it's important or no, it is not important. You need to have an idea of uh, you know whether a is it insulated, b. What is the size of that tank? If our flows are immense, let's say thousands of kilograms per minute, um, losing three kilowatt, 10 kilowatt or something like that to surroundings is not a hell of a lot in terms of what the, the, the amount of energy is that uh, passes through that. Now, the correct, well, if we want to be chemists or physicists that want to have everything spot on correct, we can say yes, ambient conditions will affect it because it does but the magnitude of that effect is it really relevant to the model that we are developing to the control system that we want to eventually um, implement if a change in our ambient conditions of two degrees affects our system substantially and you have to you know really move up your uh, manipulated variable to to supply the energy then yes it is um, uh, important if it uh, you know if it doesn't make a big change then no it's not important in chemical processes it's usually not important we have steam at 10 bar that's probably at what 200 and something degrees C if it's saturated um, so there's a hell of a lot of energy that goes into that system uh, and the change of surroundings going from 25 degrees to 20 degrees meh Drop, uh, drop in the bucket. Anyway, that's where I'm going to stop for today. Uh, sorry for the long, lengthy lecture on stuff that you know, don't need to know for now, but at least hopefully you have some form of an understanding. We'll uh, conclude uh, part 2.2 tomorrow and start with degrees of freedom analysis as well. I shall see you tomorrow morning at 9.30. Hope you have a good day and uh, enjoy the rest of the day.